Hi, um, welcome. We're really happy to be here and we're really happy that you're here too. To set this up for this afternoon, um, the three of us are going to talk with each other um, and present around the ideas of living currency and the girl online. We've each chosen two prompts to articulate and explore our views and our, um, our thoughts through various means. And the way that it's going to work is like this. The three of us, first Rachel, then myself, and then Alex, are going to present one of our prompts and then discuss with each other. And then we will present the second round of prompts, one, two, three, and discuss again. And then we will wrap it up. And that's what we're going to do. So, with no delay, I'll hand over to Rachel. Um, so, my first prompt uh, for today is going to be um, the good life and financial nihilism. I just want to play um, a short video. So, there's no sound, hopefully. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just want to think about this idea of something called a good life. Um, so I think millennials and Gen Z were raised very much to be self-entrepreneurs, to believe that if you just like worked or studied hard enough, that success was in your future. And that failure was maybe a personal blight for not working hard enough. Um, born between like the mid 80s or the early noughties, our identities were shaped by, you know, post-communist politics. I, for example, was sent um, to a fancy dress party, uh, age five, uh, dressed as the Berlin Wall. Um, <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and moulded, I guess, by things like the speculation or the excess of the dot-com era and the uncertainty of the financial crash. Um, and somewhere in there, I feel like the, the dream of things like uh, secure housing or even just the idea that you would go to college, get a secure job, get a mortgage, those very secure pathways to, to the good life. And that sense that that good life could be worked for or bought or built just began to feel a lot less um, secure. Um, and there was, I think, a general sense maybe that hard work didn't matter maybe neither did good bets or doing all of the right things. And some have referred to this idea as financial nihilism. Um, so, and I think often financial nihilism is expressed or it's, it's often associated with this particular kind of YOLOing or, you know, the sort of crypto, um, Wall Street bets, kind of the swinging dicks of GameStop or, you know, um, the kind of, um, Crypto.com ads like Fortune Favorites the Brave. Um, but I began to wonder whether maybe some of the sort of practices that we see online, um, particularly around women, like um, maybe the stay at home girlfriend, for example, the trad wife, if these were also practices that could be associated with a particular kind of financial nihilism or a particular sort of end of the good life. Another sort of an expression of this sort of end of days or end of good life thinking. Um, so some people are embracing a sort of a return to 1950s homemaking or to embracing the sort of bimbo, the sort of radical dumbness or the girl math um, to game the system, or the sort of NPC streamer getting paid in virtual ice creams the girl styled as Ariel from The Little Mermaid, searching for a sugar daddy to pay off her loans. Um, so some are YOLOing in the absence of a clear pathway to the good life. Others are becoming stay-at-home girlfriends. So when girl bossing fails, these women are getting by in virtual gifts, treats, or Amazon wish lists. And why not? You know, the good life isn't coming in any other way. Um, so rather than trying to buy a house or build a girl boss empire, there's a sense of maybe that you could retreat to a time when things feel more secure, um, which is supposed to be, you know, the 1950s housewife, that particular routine. And, you know, if the bimbo ethos of no thoughts, just vibes is supposed to be believed, that sort of lobotomized, lobotomized outlook 
on current events. Um, so, Lauren Berlant um, wrote about cruel optimism in 2010, which is supposed to be this desire that keeps us attached to something that ultimately harms us. Um, and it takes different forms from desires for romantic love to upward mobility. But at the center of that were these sort of dreams of something that you called, that we were supposed to call the good life. So fantasies that you recruit to make sense of the world or the stories that you tell yourself about how the world is supposed to like add up to something. Um, and those are stories like, you know, there's stories about mm, hard work rewarded or bullies beaten or winning the system. And she sort of asked, like, why do people stay attached to those fantasies even when um, all evidence sort of points to the contrary? And what happens, as in the financial crash and, you know, as in the pandemic, um, when those fantasies, like, begin to fray, when, you know, to put it in terms that Berlant never would, um, when, when shit hits the fan. Um, and Berlant's a scholar of affect, so, you know, she's looking at the many ways in which the present is, is sensed and felt. And today, I think a lot of these feelings are, you know, they're reflected in things like um, TikTok channels that claim that we can manifest wealth by, you know, being Delulu or on subreddits like Wall Street Bets, and even arguably in the sort of financial apathy of stay-at-home girlfriends, or TikToks, practicing self-care, money witches manifesting financial rewards, or finfluencers who are urging their followers to buy worthless Tupperware stock. So all kind of trying to figure out what future security might look like. Um, and this effect is sort of felt as well in like tradwives who are shilling financial dependence on strong male providers. Um, And it's, I suppose, all just kind of coming down to sort of this idea, you know, as Berlant is sort of putting it there, that very much that there's just sort of a sense that there's no guarantees, you know, that kind of the life one intends can or will be built. And maybe I'll just kind of pause my little uh, running slides sort of there. Um, and hand over or go into some conversation. Um, thank you. I will pick up the baton <laughs> for um, my, my next section. My, my first prompt that I've chosen is history. Um, so we're not going as far back as the 1950s for The Good Life, but we are going back to the mid-1990s, to the dot-com era, uh, to the boom before the bust. Um, I've always been fascinated by this period um, of what happened when the internet came along, which feels archaic at this point, 30 years on, far too many, as this place where we have the precursor of platforms. But I think for what we've been thinking about of the girl online and the girl as currency, it's kind of worth looking at how this move happened at this point, whether girls and women were invented for the internet or not. My starting point here for a lot of the work, as with a lot of the work that I've done, is from the um, adult entertainment industry. And there's a, kind of a very standard trope that um, the adult entertainment industry kind of pushed the internet, the internet pushed it. And there's a kind of a slippage in this. Um, prior to the internet, prior to, say, the early 90s, the mid-90s, there was a vast amount of the material of girls and women that existed um, as magazines, as personal photos, as etchings, as... VHS as Betamax, as DVDs, as CD-ROMs, all of this existed in material format. And when the internet came along, there was an idea that the existing extant adult industry firms, particularly the large ones, were able to take advantage of it very, very quickly, producing new content, putting it up online, creating kind of the precursors of the spaces of what we know now. This broadly didn't happen, um, as with a lot of things where you have a vast technological disruption, the large companies struggled. And what happened instead was that this body, this archive of girls and women became moved online through a separate body of channels. So this, this wave of material was um, very little of it was actually put up there by its producers and owners, and very little of it at that point was actually new. Instead, it was stolen, it was scanned, it was copied, and then it was uploaded, and then it was sold. And there was very little recourse to this at the time. 
If you're thinking about how this may have worked with more mainstream institutions, Napster is, of course, the case of uh, the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing net um, network, primarily dealing with audio files that was released in 1999 and shut down in 2002 after court order. But this equivalent shutting down didn't really happen for adult content um, and for people whose private images ended up online. And eventually, the adult industry started producing work content that was designed to be exhibited, designed to be consumed online, that has an echo of the previous technological shifts of um, the emergence of handheld video cameras where people could shoot their own content, the emergence of uh, digital formats, again, such as DVDs and CD-ROMs, where you could jump through the chapters. So the nature of it changed. But I kind of, I want to point us to, um, to this woman that some of you may recognize. Um, this is Jennifer Ringley, um, and this is some of the first, I would say, original material to be produced by the author of The Girl Online to exist within the online matrix. Um, Jennifer produced Jenny Cam. This is one of the stills that we can see here. Um, arguably the first Cam girl who, and she began what she called life casting everything, everything of her life. Um, the idea was if she held back anything, it wouldn't be real, so it was all there. Um, she began this in 1996. Again, this is the era where um, the internet is starting to crawl into the world. Um, and although now she's kind of, I think, held up as more, again, the emergence of Big Brother, the emergence of like, um, again, of live streaming of cam girls, there's kind of, it's more, I th what I'm interested in is how she existed online and where she was existed between platforms as well. She showed everything. She showed her sex life, but that was very little of it. She showed her romantic life. She showed her parts of her work life. She showed her pets. Um, I think she, is it a ferret? I think a ferret and two cats, or two cats and a ferret. Um, they turned up as well, um, because the internet is for cats. Um, and at the height of her success, she had up to four million viewers. After a few years, she began, she originally she'd shown everything for free, and after a while she began to introduce both paid access and free access. And then she closed her site, she shut down in 2003. And there were two reasons for this. Um, the one that she gave publicly was that she had been trying to get paid through PayPal, and in 2003, uh, by 2003, um, PayPal had an anti-nudity clause. So although she would be able to show and pay, you know, people could buy pictures of her wandering around her apartment or playing with the cats, they could, that anything involving nudity wouldn't have been possible. The other reason was burnout. She was, she was online and she had been very online since she was about 19 years old and she wanted to not be. So PayPal is interesting because PayPal, like I said, Jenny Cam shut down in 2003. In 2002, PayPal had been had been made had gone public and then been sold to eBay, who had put this specific clause in place, um, which affected who can get paid and for what and and what what area. We will come back to, to this later in the session. But the, the area that I want to look at here is kind of how that those constraints came in and where currency moves through the system, where the monetary value and the capacity to pay and get paid. Um, PayPal was founded in 99 um, by Max Levchin, Luke Nosek, and Peter Thiel, and merged with Elon Musk's company in 2000. It went public in 2002. It, sold, it was sold to eBay for 1.5 billion US dollars. Um, Elon Musk, as the largest shareholder, received 175.8 million, and T Peter Thiel received 55 million. And Thiel himself continued with th this money, again, circulated because currency moves. Um, Thiel put his money from the sale towards a hedge, first a hedge fund, Clarion Capital Management, and then towards Palantir, which a company that puts data analyst, analysis software towards counterintelligence and military ends. Today, how many years are we now? 22 years after the sale of PayPal and 21 years after the founder of Palantir, uh, the company Palantir itself primarily it, it exists on government contracts. It makes up half of its over half of its revenue. The company holds contracts with the departments of defense from the USA, from Israel, and from the UK, um, where in the UK, Palantir also holds a contract with the UK National Health Service to handle patient data. And its civilian products, Palantir Metropolis, has been used, continues to be used by hedge funds. So PayPal is not Palantir, and PayPal itself is not the internet. But Palantir's formation was made possible from the sale of PayPal, and that's the thing I, I think I want to hand over the baton here for as well, that currency can be generated and currency can be spent. It moves, it translates. 
when I was thinking about Jenny Cam, I had been, and the other girls online, I'd been thinking about what type of currency is the girl online? Um, could she be thought of as a form of metalism, where her value derives from her purchasing power? Is she a form of time-based currency, where her value is not the composition of what she is, but the amount of time we hold for engagement and consumption? Is she representative currency? Does she represent something of value, but has little value in and of herself? And how do these forms of currency move and translate between the platforms and the institutions that also control their movement? And I'll hand over to Alex. Speaking of girls online, um, I'm going to start with a song by Heart Locket. Heart. <laughs> Um, so beautiful. I I'm going to read a bit from a text I wrote for the Cream Cake book that addresses this particular kind of girl online. A particular kind of player, global, sculpted, rich and femme, has mastered the body as image and how to siphon money through its virality, maintenance, knowledge exchange and mimesis. This particular girl has turned the body into pure vector, using it to maneuver the platform for her own profit her constant devising of new ways to top the shifting criteria of attention and engagement has, in turn, reshaped the platform in her image. The feeds architects have, in fact, invested millions into, quote, super user research, trying to decode the mystery of how exactly the most popular girls have gamed their social infrastructures. Yet these girls do not always play nice with these architects, as evidenced by the ban of explicit content, sex workers, and usually fembots across every major platform, and their uneasy reinstatement after steep capital losses. This girl's cunning primacy may well contribute to the present day expansion of social platforms into the realm of bodilessness, the reason being market dynamics just as these entities that command Euro-American attention and discourse have invested significantly in strengthening their attachments with the NBU, or next billion users, of the Global South, marketing and innovation strategy has also gone in search of white space opportunities in overdeveloped markets. Tired of grappling with the issues of censorship, verification, and declining mental health that plagues the prioritization of supposedly real bodies on social media, tech giants have also identified the next zone of capture as a world without human form. Um, so as a technique of the self that requires maintenance, so whether surgical, implanted, trained, or self-assembling, the act of constructing the ultra-smooth girl body I think I forgot to mention my prompt is ultra smooth, so if I say it a lot, it's for that reason. Um, the act of constructing the ultra smooth girl body is controversial to many. It's seen by its enemies as a violation of sovereignty, paradoxically a corruption of a body whose implied impenetrability increases its value as private property. Anyone who has been online at all is familiar with the rages of anonymous misogynists and their dislike for being duped. As for everyone else, there is the understanding that access to bodily reality in practice is completely contingent and usually elusive, counter to how the platform treats bodies themselves. Yet a new entrant has come to face off with girls made of flesh and silicon in the competitive market of capitalist desire one who even further troubles the fake boundary between real and, real and authentic, fake and authentic. Um, AI-generated influencers and adult stars appear as the smoothest of all objects of desire, materializing pure fantasy with the most bare bones of prompts. They offer complete novelty in spite of being an assemblage of statistical averages. They are especially impenetrable because they have no interiority to clean or censor and require no paradoxical injections or incisions to maintain their exterior perfection. They are all exterior even when they're prompted to open up. Where the ultra smooth subject in the platform age had an equal dependency on workers who could clean up the mess of her blood, cum, and gore, the synthetic star needs no such staff or rider. 
So we're all girl subjects risk being transformed by those who desire them into sites of pure projection. The synthetic star goes one step further, becoming an open field for prompting. So Such an existence pries open age-old worries about human replaceability and the corruption of desire itself, thoroughly salting the human wound with all its encoded insecurities through enabling hyper-specific fantasy that in its complete knowing and total signification, haters say will kill desire itself. The final mechanism that turns all eroticism into pornography, all friction into fantasy. After all, everyone knows that total and continuous satisfaction turns into numbness. Getting everything you want kills the pleasure of wanting itself, lulling us into a strange infinity that always feels like a post-orgasmic nap. As Byung-Chul Han writes, only the rhythmic oscillation between presence and absence, veiling and unveiling, keeps the gaze awake. The erotic also depends on the staging of an appearance as disappearance. So piercing through this numbness of total signification requires an incision or impact. So where the ultra smooth is a total condition where, and I'm quoting Byung-Chul Han again, the shined object annuls all that is placed before it, all negativity is eliminated. Every body as it appears on the platform and now in the recursive loop of the prompt and the data set is now an image in need of a wound. So maybe we can open it up from there. Yeah, do we want to have a little discussion before we move around to our next yeah. bunch of prompts? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to jump in with something? Ah, <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I actually, I kind of wanted to ask Alex how you came to, to sort of write about the girl kind of as the subject because I had a real like blow my mind moment, a real fangirl moment in the summer uh, when I came across your piece in Wired on the girl online because I've been writing about, well I, I was writing about um, like um, streamers on Twitch I guess, the year before, and sort of money. And I was really interested in how streamers were being paid um, in virtual tokens on Twitch and in Amazon wish lists, and the ways in which those sorts of tokens were sort of being used to make that sort of work appear invisible. Um, I was really interested in virtual streamers as well, which maybe is a little bit like the sort of ultra smooth girls you're describing there. So these are like uh, animated streamers who actually make more money than a lot of the real women who are working on the platform. Um, and then in the summer, there was this breakout moment where Pinky Doll, who's this um, streamer on TikTok, uh, was getting paid thousands to repeat phrases like yum yum ice cream so good in exchange for like virtual roses and virtual ice creams and um, yeah I don't know I was I was sort of trying to articulate like what is going on here what is the economy of this and then Alex had this really uh, amazing article called everybody is a girl online um, in which she's engaging with the philosophy of um, the the collective tycoon, um, and um, you kind of drew out this piece in the middle of that where they talk about the girl as a, a living currency, and for me it was like this huge like bingo moment. Um, and anyway, I'll start talking about me, and I yeah. want to hear all about sort of how how you came to 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 write about this stuff. Yeah, I think all three of us have this shared concern about mm -hmm. the sort of economy of like, I guess like vectors of girl, things that are shaped like a girl and how they move more easily online and how that doesn't necessarily uh, rely on a particular body. Um, there's an amazing essay on mo anthropomorphism. So if people aren't familiar, that's like a practice in Japanese animation of making something like a battleship or a virus into a kind of hot girl. And this theorization of even the Mo having a particular girl dimension to it while being completely inhuman. I think that sort of thing was what piqued my curiosity about what if we removed the girl from really trad ideas of you know Victorian childhood, innocence, 
things that aren't really actually accessible to a lot of people who are highly successful at using um, girl subjectivity online, whether it's people from the global south or people from non-conforming gender identities or people who simply see girlness as something alien to them and therefore more manipulable as um, a vehicle. Uh, so that sort of was what piqued my curiosity for this essay and I think that we also, all three of us have this interest in um, how the image also starts floating away from any particular body and then develops its own kind of vector of movement. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, I guess it was just interesting because I saw like maybe it was just two years ago, like you published a book with Zone Books, right? On drones. So did you come to girls through like the sort of militarized uh, girl uh, through the work? You did that amazing performance yesterday with, with Nora. I mean, was that your sort of... I think that the, I think all these dimensions always have like, they, they have infinite sides to them. I think that the, yeah, it's sometimes very weird to tell people that I wrote a book about drones and then a bunch of stuff about girls. Um, but a big part <laughs> of the girl as an inhuman subject was one that actually was thinking about how were this, how in spite of being an increasingly entrenched individualist culture, especially in how these architectures of these social uh, platform architectures create individual profiles based on behavioral capture, so what the algorithm is learning from your behavior on these platforms. Um, in spite of that, it seems like the most successful figures are happy to dissolve their individuality in that kind of classical human sense, right? So this sort of trend that you were covering with streamers like NPCs, um, adult stars through history, there's this kind of acceptance and acquiescence to certain tropes or structures um, which may or may not be, uh, you know, uh, ambivalent or I guess difficult ways to live um, as a body in the world, um, but instead seeing that as a way of getting what you need. And I think um, in your book, for example, with tokens, that really explores how people are sort of making their subjectivity much more smooth to facilitate the receipt of things like tokens, so like virtual ice creams or things on their Amazon wish list. Um, so, yeah, I was wondering if um, one of you could actually speak more about this kind of, I guess, the relationship between these girl subjects and this infrastructure, because it's not quite an adversarial relationship, um, but it's not quite a complicit one either. There's always a bit of, um, like, cunning um, between how this, the girl subject interacts with things like PayPal or Amazon um, or Instagram, for example. I feel like you should start because you're, you know, you 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 begin with the sort of history of of PayPal and the sort of porn yeah. infrastructure, and I can I, jump in. So yeah, I'm kind of. I think there's something in this about the kind of the, again, the ultra smooth is such a great idea. That this idea of frictionless uh, that allows you to kind of like slide through the world, but also not really be perceived because you're just very smooth. Don't look at me. <laughs> um, and there was definitely something I think for where this kind of what is what is defined as smooth and what is defined as friction and what is you know, defined as deviant as well mm. with these things. Um, I think the, pay the PayPal case is really interesting in that, and this is something I talk about a little in my book, of before it got sold to eBay, um, its founders, and particularly Musk, were actually quite open to PayPal being used by the adult industry. They went to trade fairs um, to try and see if anyone could, you know, would be interested in using, you know, this payment, this digital payment platform, which to an extent circumvented credit cards. It kind of circumvented a lot of the messy infrastructure that payment is. Um, and within within the company, there was tension about this. Um, that certainly those at the top felt like this is quite a good idea. They were also investigating gambling. They were basically trying to find you know, a, a business model. Um, and others within the company were just like, this is a truly terrible idea. We're, we're not going anywhere near adult. Um, but this came on the back of the adult industry finding it difficult to get paid as well for exactly these reasons. And it's, again, not necessarily a question of stigma or social deviance, but much more one about risk and what is the risky subject. So is the risky subject one where you are more likely to become a victim of fraud? Is the risky subject one where your product is likely to be uncertain or will break or is just, just not what you actually paid for? Which I think, again, with the idea of the frictionless subject is super interesting. It's like, are you getting what you paid for? 
do you know what you're paying for? Are you just giving, you know, ice cream tokens into the void and, ho and hoping <laughs> that something will come back from it? Um, so in, for credit cards, there's a very, you know, specific risk categories that adult industry, the adult industry is there. Also horoscopes, also some kind of um, independent pharmaceuticals, or the travel industry to an extent because things get cancelled. So trying to kind of find a space for payment was kind of where PayPal came in as something that at that point had said, you know, prior to the sale in 2002, we're potentially open to this, this is great. And then they sold and then that, got, and then that route got shut down. So I think it's, this, again, the kind of the stuff that both of you have thought about of like, well, if the major infrastructures are shut off, how can, like you said, how can you be cunning? Like, how can you have either tokens? How can you have um, kind of Amazon hey, wish lists? How can you buy things? Wh which again, tr it's this, this idea of currency translating into currency, translating into currency. So you're not taking the simple thing that can then be held in a bank account and then kind of translated into something else. But it's something that kind of itself has to move through spaces and then as it does so, translate through different forms of value. I think that's what I'm also super interested in. So you start with something of like, are you something starting with something with cultural capital or subcultural capital or erotic capital? But then that turns into a different form of capital. And these kind of, you know, these these slippery fish that keep swimming around the system, um, as you know, and which eventually will translate and translate and translate and translate. Um, and, but, but, and also, which I think I've always found fascinating about the subjects of both of your work, of like, how do you, how do you know this? Like, at what point does it become almost um, formalized that if you want to get paid, if you want to, you know, if you want to profit in some way, then you have to have these other structures in place to move through as well? Um, yeah, that was, do we want to jump on from there or should we move on yeah. to round two? Well, I just, I think, um, the, just on the kind of topic of the precarious payment, and maybe then that does sort of lead into kind of maybe the market thing. But um, the, um, yeah, the, the, like in tokens, it's very much about kind of, um, I was sort of drawn to that idea of like precarious payment as well, like um, because, yeah, during the financial crash, like people I knew were being paid in like one for all gift cards, which is happening again, actually. Like a student of mine told me they were paid exclusively in gift cards by their uh, restaurant, you know, the whole way through the pandemic um, the other day in a class. And um, this idea of, you know, something, I, I think what you were just saying there is so interesting about how they, the sort of money is like, it's a sort of something that, can kind of exploit, but also be exploited by the girl in that situation. That um, um, on those platforms, the sort of token is, it's a way of exploiting the, the streamer, you know, because the token's sort of a regulatory sleight of hand. It's a way of sort of employing without being seen to employ and sort of being a, a bank without being seen to be a bank. And there's all sorts of exploitation there. Um, and yet it also provides these kind of strange sorts of loopholes as well for for the for the worker to be paid for kind of extra legal work and also to sort of exploit as you were saying they're like parasocial connections with people online in order to like be paid so kind of finding these ways of being paid for like uh, cultivating kind of you know messy or like social relationships with somebody um but yeah i don't know you were i don't have the clock there so i don't know was that a nudge to Queen keep the going the time um, there's was just one thing i was going to quickly say to that and then if okay. we really then jump forward yeah. um when you were saying about gift cards one of the th and the kind of i guess maybe we've been thinking well thinking about like which uh, which sharp edge of the power dynamic are you on if you're trying to trying to get paid and one of the things i found really interesting with gift cards is that they can be a really useful way of escaping a domestic violence situation or an abusive situation where you need to stash money somehow. You need to have something for when you leave, but you can't drain the bank account. So you buy gift cards, and that means that when you leave, you will have this thing that may also, again, which I think coming back to where there are signals of payment, you know, would not show up on the credit card bills as anything obvious, but just it's an X amount of Amazon gift card that when you move, then you then move into this world of parallel or kind of sec different currency until you can kind of come out into the public again. Um, and I've always found, yeah, finding ways in which the, um, who has access to the roots of legitimate currency, but also how are they marked in the way in, in your life as well? What shows up on credit card bills and who is, who is looking at that as well? 
With that, shall we move on to round two? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see, can I get the video up? Oh, hang on. Um. Okay. All right. Um, so, <laughs> my second prompt uh, then is sort of the market, which kind of ties in with what we were just talking about there. Um, so, mm, let's see where I am. Um, so yeah, the you know we, we were just literally talking about this idea of the girl as a living currency a minute ago. Um, so this quote, which comes from the anonymous collective to come, um, that you know where men might be actually interested in their use value, that she measures herself for her own worth in terms of her her market rate. So the money's everywhere, but it comes wrapped up in, in particular sorts of aesthetics from girl dinners to, you know, Amazon wish lists or virtual ice creams. Um, and um, yeah, so sometimes the money, it can be difficult to see the money, um, but um, it's actually everywhere, but in these sorts of codified ways. And nowhere maybe is that negotiation more visible, but sometimes in the economy of these sorts of online like trad wife communities. So I spent a lot of the summer kind of lurking um, for reasons I'll explain in a minute um, on the Red Pill Women um, website. Um, so that's, uh, it's not like the sort of influencer side of, of trad wives. This is for women who kind of aspire to become kind of traditional trad wives and aspire to sort of that traditional like financial dependence sort of model on, on a male partner. And you know, what I found really interesting, I suppose, about this was that even though they're sort of aspiring to that very sort of traditional model, they, the sort of, um, the way in which the, the kind of relationship is actually articulated is in a very sort of an economic or kind of game theoretical fashion. So, um, you know, they're sort of speaking in terms very much of, um, you know, sexual market value and relationship market value. Um, so, you know, they're kind of quite self explanatory, I guess. And those are, you know, your, um, yeah, your worth is sort of those two metrics kind of multiplied by and kind of plus or minus how far away you are from the wall, which as far as I know is like age 30. And um, that's kind of then how sort of your your own worth is, is sort of calculated within this particular space. So there's very kind of stark economics to happily ever after in a lot of these space. So... Um, I think within a lot of, uh, you know, the sort of the economy of the girl is often, you know, it hinges a lot of the time on this idea of being somehow outside of the market. Um, and maybe this is sort of what we are, we are sort of playing with when, when we sort of, we talk about this idea of the sort of currency that, that is, is sort of at work within, within the girl or within the economy of the girl. Um, not unlike maybe the economy of actually the art market in some ways, in that it, it's sort of it's framed on this sort of idea that somehow these things are hostile worlds or that they are outside of the market in the same way that maybe ostensibly sex work, care work uh, are supposed to be outside of the market but aren't really. So, you know, the economist, um, economic anthropologist Viviana Zelitzer calls this idea hostile worlds to name this theory, you know, that things like money and intimacy, money and sex, money and family life, and, you know, money and, like, selling your organs, for example, are supposed to be separate spheres, and yet, you know, as we know, they, they aren't just generally, these things are all transacted in, but they're just codified in particular ways. You know, lots of people in this room are probably wearing engagement rings or wedding rings, for example. Um, but um, there's, you know, there's a whole, you know, the whole economy of marriage and of women's money, you know, as Georgina was even talking about a minute ago, sort of based around how these things are, are codified. And Zelitzer is really, really interested 
really, really interested in this and did really, really interesting work on this in the 1990s, you know, where she looked at how women's money, for example, in relationships and in marriage was codified throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. Like, how, how was women's allowances, or pin money, as it was called, codified, um, to kind of distinguish it, for example, from like a wage or a gift or an allowance. Um, and as people are probably familiar with, sorry, this is a... Um, Shira Seven, who gives you know a lot of advice on TikTok on, on how to uh, get your partner to give you money, but um, in the 1970s, Silvia Federici, you know, who's a Marxist feminist, was involved in a you know a similar campaign um, called Wages for Housework, um, where they were you know campaigning, I suppose, to to bring a wage for, you know, to recognize, I suppose, the labor within housework. And Federici, you know, is really interesting because they're, they're arguing that the, the question of a wage wasn't really about the money. You know, it was about by, by sort of asking for a wage, you're making something that was ostensibly natural, like visible. So she's sort of saying that, you know, the money isn't really what's at stake here, but by asking for money, uh, we're making something that is sort of seen to be sort of natural to the woman visible. And once it's visible as work, now we can begin to sort of refuse it as work and, and refuse it on those particular terms. Um, and, you know, sort of just as the kind of work of the housewife is kind of being framed as not really real work, um, the sort of the, the sort of the home life or the life of the family is often framed as this sort of respite from the demands of working life and capitalism, and you get that I think with this sort of trad wife, you know, with a lot of this sort of girl online content that we're seeing now that it's like, oh, you know, I'm fed up with being a girl boss. I just want to buy a cow, and like move home, you know, like get a farm, um, and yet, you know. I think while a lot of these women are kind of positioning themselves maybe in opposition to this, um, probably as we're all, you know, very, very much aware of, the, the, the sort of whole model of, of this sort of girl online has always sort of been based on this kind of, this opposition of kind of monetizing this sort of affective or this sort of care work. In some ways, you know, our housewife is, she's the kind of OG, uh, Influencer, you know, it's it's no, um, it's no, basically, it's no coincidence that you know, the first sort of people who figured out how to monetize content on the internet, you know, even before like Jenny Cam, where you know our mom influencers with internet banners in the 1990s, and in some ways it's because you know they're they're the first people who sort of kind of understood that sort of authenticity work or that care work were were women you know, arguably, long before even people like Zoella were kind of perfecting the anxiety video. You had, you know, um, or before Jennifer Ringley or before that girl, you had kind of even very kind of straightforward um, housewives already kind of schooled in this sort of work. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's sort of my my, my kind of second point, I guess, about sort of the market maybe and the currency of the girl. Um, sorry, I don't know how long that is. It's just some random videos about manifesting money <laughs> for us all. All right, no, we're good. Um, yeah. I will move on to my second... Um, <laughs> my second prompt, which was containers, if we can get... The guys up. Is this where we have to meow? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we're going to start here as an exercise. I realized there was like um, quite a lot of us in the room and this suddenly lent, when I came in yesterday, and this lent itself maybe to an exercise with us to move into this. So you may have seen these guys online. These are a merging of two separate cat videos with quite distinct sonic tones. And before we explore them, um, what I would like to do is to see whether we collectively can become... Um, the non-human girl online traveling through cats. Um, so if I can have the, the, the volume up a little to do this. Okay. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to do this together. Um, 
Um, I'm going to let you listen to it once more, and then I will meow it. Um, and if you two wish to join me, I'd be delighted. So which cat are we? Uh, we're, we're, both, we're, both, we're both whichever cat you want to be. Um, the, the tabby one is probably easier, the brown cat, tabby. because it only it had a little meow one. That one um, all right. There's two. So it's tw- once more okay thank you <laughs> Um, so I've been, fa- I've been fascinated by these guys for quite a long while, and I kind of wanted to use them as a way of thinking about um, uh, particularly what Alex is talking about with the kind of the non-human girl, and I think really with the idea of travelling online of like, what is the minimal viable girl online? Um, so there are, this is used as kind of, I guess, a, a meme container, something to hold the, like, an idea which can then travel. Um, and it has, it has, there are a number of different ones, but the dynamics that play out in each of these are very similar. And I'm going to read out to you um, a couple of, what, of the title and what they are. In every single case um, of the ones I found, um, the boyfriend is coded as the orange cat, the one who's doing the kind of longer, kind of like almost choral singing. And me, who is coded as girlfriend, is the shorter tabby, that one. Okay, so. Title, first one, title. My boyfriend was on late shift and I was home alone all day. Boyfriend, did you drink something? Me, one Red Red Bull, I'm hungry. Number two, title. My wife and me every day. Me, babe, another Amazon package. Her, it was on sale. Me, we have to save money. Her. So you don't love me? Title. My boyfriend bought a sweater. Boyfriend. Where is the sweater I bought a few weeks ago? Me. It's mine. Boyfriend. But I bought it for me. Me. It's mine. Buy another one for us. And finally. Title. Point of view. Me and my boyfriend in a dinner. Him. I will pay for the dinner. Me, okay, sad face. Him, are you going to pay for something? Me, parking and a kiss. So there's this kind of this, this coding in this that kind of comes through of um, how the container of the cats, this kind of this template allows for a very specific like gendered reading of what is happening here and what is happening here around money as well. Um, the one I couldn't find was um, in time for to kind of to write it down was the the hard the, always the hard done by a slightly stressed looking orange cat boyfriend um, talking about their anniversary and the the sad tabby cat saying well we can go to the four seasons and the orange boyfriend cat saying but that's very expensive and the tabby girl cat saying but divorce is more expensive <laughs> <laughs> so this thing that kind of allows it to travel of like what is what is human and what is non-human um, in if everyone everything is girls, what is a minimal viable girl? Um, and can, I'm curious again. I guess this maybe will come into the discussion of can the non-human girl travel faster? Is she is, does she have more velocity, or kind of where does the kind of the femininity or the girlness ca- carry with this as well? In a way, these feel like the opposite of um, the highly sexualized battleships, you know, which are sexualized. This is kind of the, the, the internet is for cats, but the internet is for cats, and they are reenacting and reenacting and reenacting the same kind of procedure of I'm at home all alone, alone all day, my boyfriend brings in money, um, but he's, you know, but I spend his money, but also I'm slightly useless, I'm just drinking Red Bull, I'm not drinking water, but, you know, he is always worried, but I am always sad, and round and round and round and round it goes into infinity. So the, the meme template allows thing, allows ideas to travel, but it's also contained as well. Even if it's kind of it's played with, it still it always does this again and again. Um, and I've been thinking about this with the kind of the idea of the uh, going, going back to the Tikkun collective of the young girl um, to something that the artist and writer Fair Boyd talks about in their um, essay, a theory of the strange girl, raw red text. Um, 
Boyd wrote this in 2017, and their, their argument was kind of placing the kind of the predictability of the young girl online who is contained and who is knowable and who moves in the same way against the strange girl who is more slippery and different and might operate through different channels and have different affordances. I think particularly when we were thinking about kind of smoothness and ultra smoothness and like where, where is the space for friction and smoothness. So I wanted to read um, an extract from a theory for the strange girl to kind of, I think for puts it beautifully, to think about where there might be this kind of this, this friction and this rub and this kind of this, this grit in the tank um, in how we're thinking about how these things move. So Fair writes, the strange girl is spawned in the moment of the camera flash. In it, her form is generated. And so she may be imagined as moving in flashes of light which slice through the air. This coming out of nowhere is also a power afforded to witches who may appear or disappear in puffs of smoke lit by sparks. To imagine this ability, we may, we, we may also turn to cartoonic physics, which allow characters the remit to appear suddenly from nothing. The young girl is utterly predictable and reproducible to an exact mimesis. She likes everything to be known, expected and the same, mimicking originality to sate any desire for it. The young girl hates the unexpected, especially when it is not programmed. The ability to come out of nowhere therefore allows the strange girl the element of surprise. Her target will not see her coming. The strange girl thus comes into being as a phenomenon, such as an aurora. Phenomena are things which appear without logic and or reason and therefore without a, future, a function in the eye of capitalism. They are autonomous things that simply are. They are not in the business of representing themselves. In a circus poster from the mid-1960s, strange girls are pro pro proclaimed as a freak being. The poster questions, can they marry like other girls, have children, be as happy as they are? Why were they born? By appearing instantaneously without warning, the strange girl has no visible process of being birthed and therefore cannot be given a trajectory of becoming and so cannot be appropriated or held still. Your hands will only grasp at air if you try to catch her. So with that, I will wrap up my section and hand to Alex to finish us. Thank you. No more meowing? We can. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're just going to play one video first. And you know something else, Daddy? <laughs> You're welcome. Mommy is just so sick and tired of wearing panties. Yeah? Yeah. But no touching. Oh, gosh. <laughs> the less you give to me, the more I want it. You can have whatever you like. Cartier handcuffs, princess cuts, checks, and baguettes. Money is the anthem of success. I forgot to say my prompt again, which is liquid. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find out why soon. Um, the only thing I know about money is how to spend it, ideally somebody else's. The fantasy is about pure liquidity. I don't dream about the line going up or being tapped on the ass by the inv invisible hand of the market. I still want cash. I fantasize about it like filling a mattress stacked in a safe, fanned out across my arm or so thick I can pose with it like a phone. I wanna buy a house with cash on hand. I wanna stage a photo shoot where me and my girls roll around in it, pure filth, the eroticism of hundreds of thousands of hands on our grubby money, touching our perfect, untouchable bodies. To quote the philosopher Gwen Stefani, sorry, I just realized how unhinged this text is. If I was a wealthy girl, I would get me four Harajuku girls. I'd give them names, love, angel, music, baby. I've come to terms that I'm often closer to cash than any clean, smooth vector. The country that I'm from is best known for human exports, laborers in love and logistics. Its cultural history inseparable from the clear exchange of American dollars for nights of tropical desire. Hard cash for immeasurable affect, unforgettable memories, a fucked up power dynamic. Cash is the lubricant for a particular fantasy, one that doesn't seem to get any easier as it unfolds, as the cash runs out like water or gasoline from a full tank. Cash means hitting dead end after dead end, never going to the moon, even while you dream of the coolness of gold bars and marble countertops, the chrome rims on your escalade. 
cash means hitting dead ends, and thinking the impact means you're winning. It just feels so good. I think about the scene from Wolf of Wall Street where Leonardo DiCaprio tapes handfuls of dollars to a blonde girl's body while she sneers, I don't work for you. I think about getting paid out in paper bags full of cash, rolling suitcases full of cash, a sign that you're doing something illicit, that you're getting to the top even though you shouldn't be, that you're gambling against bad odds, and that you're risking it all, and that you're worth it. When I think about liquidity, I think about the writer and sex worker Charlotte Shane describing the experience of repacking her suitcase of whores tokens in a luxury hotel lobby, the pleasure of putting vulgar riches on show, designer dresses, expensive underwear, and diamonds for breakfast. It's not just because I don't know what a stock is, it's because I like having my money where I can see it. It's the habit unshakable by sly underdogs the world over. In a cashless society predicated on digital payments and financial abstraction, cash itself is a signifier of doing something the dirty way, of being closer to the quick, somehow exceptional, even though up to 12% of the global economy is wrapped up in criminal activity, as Sayak Valencia writes in Gore Capitalism. Even though everyone's hands are dirty, status is just the distance you can put between yourself and the bloodshed of capital through abstraction. Cash is the only money that feels real to me because it smells like plastic, blood, ash, and cum, which is why I'm strangely precious about it, hoarding bills when I get them, stuffing them into a beat up generic white envelope that is torn at the edges and still bears my grandmother's handwriting for when she gave me a healthy handful of great British pounds, marking the occasion that I moved to the European continent. The cash fantasy is to be so drenched in realism that you become untouchable. The cash fantasy means rolling around in your compromises and consequences, like they're filling a bathtub in a climate-cooled hotel suite at the top of the world. Cash means being liquid, converted without losing your power, converted without risking your decline, rinsing off both ideology and the market in favor of hand-to-hand, -hand, under the table, paper bag dealings. In the words of the poet and sex worker, Rachel Rabbit White, and if I've ever suffered, I truly never felt it. And in the words of Heart Locket, again. I need you like I need to draw hearts on this money, like I'm running from the law through the snow on my bare feet, bleeding cash blood for miles, calling 911, saying, Help me, I love you, but only because you are beautiful like cash. Remember last summer when it felt like we could never die? And now it feels like we have never not been dead. I need a heart girl like pouring out my heart like a heart star. You have no idea what this feels like. I have no idea what this feels like. There you go. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's like, I don't know if it's connected to the girl, but I'm, I'm just a, really aware of how much content there is, particularly on TikTok in the last year or two that seems to be about like, yeah, physical cash. Like, I don't know, I had images in there of like money baths or yeah, like the, of the physicality of cash or yeah. Um, yeah, I wonder about that. Cause I think that like having actual money, like the materiality of money, like when we were arranging this talk, I couldn't mm -hmm. stop thinking in song lyrics. Like I think it's really persistent as a fantasy, but also as something that feels really separate from like the increasing abstraction of finance and that abstraction often making people feel, or not making, does exclude people, not in a representation way, but just in a literal practice, financial literacy, um, uh, but also things like 
uh, you know, Jackie Wang's theory of carceral capitalism and how uh, algorithmic credits, credit systems um, often purposefully exclude certain, po certain populations. So cash becomes this very like, it's not only, it's a, a safety net for people, but in also quite a, it's tied to things like uh, history and, and race and issues like that. So I think that there's like a strange confluence of all those elements where it is highly pop cultural, but it's highly pop cultural because of this certain um, like historical insistence of uh, removing these abstracted cultures of like credit and debit and ensuring that like some of us do stay in the cash economy, um, which is really interesting to think about given the um, emphasis, especially in the policy space on like digital, the digitization of- Yeah, that. no, I wondered was it even, is it a response to a precisely demonetization around the pandemic that you're suddenly getting even this huge rise of like, I, I follow I, this really weird um, account on Instagram called the Money Witch, even, and that. But there's just a huge rise of not like I guess you know we think of influencer, you think like the kind of roaring kitty or they're like retail trader giving like financial advice. But then there's this you know there's so much just like manifestation content of you know these kinds of weird uh, like conflation of kind of mystical kind of witchy sort of practice and money? There's some, I mean, as you mentioned about influencers, um, mm. which do genuinely unsettle and stress me, of this kind of, again, this slipperiness of like, what, what was he doing and how is this working? And I think there was something about, um, in that kind of space of the, the influencer economy of, of again, um, what is being translated in terms of forms of audience and forms of affect and, you know, in terms of gifts. And there's something almost like hard cash, like a brick through the window of that, of, you know, you've got these kind of like these, not even these immaterial systems, but these very un uncertain architectures that are there that might not even be real. Um, again, thinking about the trad wife and her farm and her cow. And, um, oh, yeah. yeah. I love the one, the, one, the one I follow, she like grows plants in her garden and they're all have tags. This is a girl agrarian economy? Like, I don't know. She like um, pulls a cucumber out of the ground like, ta-da. But a lot of the, kind of the narratives that come around that, I think yeah. we, we talked about this a little when we were arranging the panel of like on the one hand, there's very much the narrative that you say of like, this is the good life and like my husband provides and I just like have many children, I look after the cow and I make, you know, delicious oatmeal. But there's an entire economy underneath that of, of that's operating in terms of um, who is, again, who is getting paid and how are they getting paid, but that is not made visible through the, the trad wife visual or cultural narrative. And to have cash suddenly <laughs> inserted like this thing onto the table, it's like, it's there, that's the money, that's where the money is coming from, that's what this is. And I guess I'm curious then, I think for both of you, of who benefits in this kind of this slippery, uncertain architecture of, of payment if, you're, if, you're, if you don't have cash on the table and it is very uncertain and unstable um, that, that things are happening but you have, to, rather than having any more structured way, you're manifesting to have something, the cow, for example. Um, who is benefiting and how through that uncertainty and that immateriality? Looking pointedly at Rachel. <laughs> I, no, I just, I was thinking um, when you were talking about PayPal that um, I interviewed um, a money burner, actually, um, when when I was writing the book, um, who, and it's just kind of interesting because he was, um, he, he actually, w in, a, in the noughties, he worked in, he, he was kind of at the at the avant-garde of, of the kind of sex work industry actually with his wife so they ran a they ran a website called natural sex um in the early noughties and but it's like a real like cottage industry so they ran it together just like a husband and wife and she was an nhs nurse and then gave that up uh to they had this just like quite like yeah, I don't know how else to describe it. Like, I think it was a little just rough and ready kind of website together um, that they ran together and had loads and loads of issues like that with payment processing because of PayPal. Um, so he sort of talked me through all of that. They went bankrupt, partly because of the 
payments processing issues uh, with being paid uh, for pornography. And then as a result of going bankrupt, um, he kind of lost all faith in the monetary system and became a, a money burner. And um, <laughs> so, uh, but instead of paying him for the interview, I burnt money. Um, and um, sorry, I, 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 I'll get to where I'm going. But uh, the, the kind of like the actual kind of material, like process of, of burning the money just was, um, it was just, it was really like, it was actually really, really kind of interesting. Uh, practice. First of all, I thought it was illegal to burn money until I did it, and it's actually <laughs> not. Um, at least it's not in Europe. Um, I'm not sure about the UK, but it's not illegal to burn money in, in Europe. There's something about... Um, oh, I'm not going to get this right at all, so someone couldn't look this up, but um, destroying the image of the monarch, I want to say. Mm. There's something around that Maybe. that feels suitably archaic. Okay. Yeah, but... yeah. No. But then the K but then the KLF did it, so maybe not. Any, um, we're, we're allowed yeah. to do it if we want. So um yeah, so um but just um yeah, it's very the whole practice is kind of ritualized in a particular way. In fact they have like I think sex parties around it. We didn't because it was COVID times, <laughs> thankfully. Um, <laughs> but um just the the kind of the whole practice was like it was really interesting because actually in burning it, you're sort of, you're forced to kind of physically contemplate, I guess, all of the sort of possible futures that that money has in a way that you wouldn't sort of otherwise and sort of actually engage with the kind of materiality of of that money um, in a way that you wouldn't sort of otherwise. Um, and I think I've sort of forgotten what your question was. Uh. Um, but you were sort of asking, I think, how, how, who sort of benefits or who, who, who sort of pushed out when cash is it? Yeah, I think I think kind of who benefits when you ha when yeah when cash is not in, yeah well, ca well pushed out, but kind of when the systems around money become more abstracted and more obfuscated as well. Um, well, like you've seen, I mean, that's the whole issue with a lot of these sort of payment systems, like, you know, we're seeing with the with the kind of sex worker with streamers is that, you know, part of the what's happening with with those tokens is that they are kind of obfuscating a kind of a, a, a sleight of hand where the platform is sort of taking a cut, you know, often it's very easy for for somebody who is um, who is kind of a member of the audience or who's a user to sort of buy into the system or to buy tokens, but for somebody who's working for the platform to actually cash out of that system, it's, it's incredibly difficult or it's, you know, there's a huge amount of friction. I thought you described it really, really well, actually, in your book on systems, you know, where you talked about how friction-free the system feels if you are a sort of a quote-unquote kind of normal user. What does the system feel like? It might not feel like anything at all. And yet, you know, if you are, quote unquote, like a sort of a deviant user or not kind of the ideal user, um, you know, if you are trying to use cash, for example, when you're not supposed to be using cash, um, then that's sort of when you sort of run into all of these sorts of moments of sort of friction or difficulty. Um, and I think, you know, that's sort of what you're seeing with a lot of these sort of online platforms. Yeah. For time. Um, oh, we're good. Um, I, was trying to, I had something in my mind, so I might see <laughs> either of you want to jump in <laughs> with. <laughs> yeah, that just reminded me of a point that we were maybe, I think, yeah, there's this idea that also it's incredibly, I mean, with all digital technology, the ways that these things are rolled out are, is incredibly uneven in spite of it being skinned in this kind of universalism of the ultra smooth, like you said, the ideal user. If you're that ideal user, you access the ultra smooth experience and the ultra smooth subjectivity, um, which is the, you know, the one that guides the platform and can kind of exist in harmony with it. Um, an interesting case study from that is, um, is the one of Axie Infinity. I think I was just thinking a lot about like, I think the 
the overarching theme of this festival being a kind of like unusability and then thinking in, in terms of uh, structures and tokens and how things are meant to move through them and how they are blocked from moving through them. Um, what was interesting to me was looking at predominantly cash societies, so like places in the global south, for example, and how these systems encounter or actually are designed to break down in these areas. So a colleague of ours was talking about how the rise of digital finance in the imperial core has in fact made banking more difficult in Jamaica um, with Axie Infinity. Uh, it was during the pandemic where a lot of Filipinos uh, lost their, uh, many of us are like, uh, overseas Filipino workers and during the pandemic that work no longer existed for a lot of people. So uh, many people actually turned to a cryptocurrency powered uh, initiative called Axie Infinity, which was like highly gamified and tokenized and it was kind of like Pokemon. Um, and I was really obsessed with the name of the thing that made the little animals mate because it was called Smooth Love Potion. Oh yeah. And it was like literally lube for these little creatures. Um, and that was the currency of this game. And actually a lot of people who were uh, used to subsist essentially a subsistence paycheck were making money on Axie and like grinding really hard in internet cafes to receive income from this crazy monster crypto game. So moving from like manual labor to that pretty wild anyway. Um, but the fact that Axie paid out in tokens that eventually became unusable and there's an ongoing scandal that a lot of these uh, gamers slash workers, new category emerging, um, could not actually access their income in spite of having put in a normal amount of shift hours to make this game profitable, right? So they were putting in eight hour shifts or more every day mm. um, just in a different kind of labor economy, AKA a highly gamified one. But the fact that the token was there actually exposed the worker to vulnerability. And I think that's something that we see across the board in terms of people who rely on tokens because their work is somewhat uh, precarious or illicit. Uh, the token actually is the site of risk because all it does is protect the purchaser uh, or the commissioner Absolutely. of the work. Yeah, it's like with Twitch bits, very similarly. Um, I was really fascinated to see that, you know, Amazon are really, really quick to state that um, bits have no monetary value whatsoever, even though people make their entire livelihood on them. Uh, if you're somebody who wants to like donate bits to a streamer that you like, you can buy them with a credit card. If you're somebody making a livelihood, then yeah, you have to, maybe a little bit like your Axie worker, you maybe have to wait quite a long time to actually get paid out. And I mean, the most extreme example obviously is uh, Amazon, you know, Amazon owned Twitch, obviously, you know, I think most people know that, but um, the most extreme example of something like that obviously is that Amazon pay their mechanical Turk workers outside of the US and I suppose, you know, most parts of the world, it's the easiest way to put it, outside of the US and more recently outside of India in Amazon gift vouchers. And, you know, uh, not just Amazon gift vouchers, Amazon gift vouchers that are sort of tied to their uh, account. So it's not even like you can, you know, sell it to your granny. <laughs> like, you know, you ca they're, they're very, you can't even really transfer the balance because it's sort of tied into your your account. So, you know, if you go on Reddit, I mean, I think that's where I do, I feel like, all my research into these things. If you go on Reddit, you'll see people trying to, trying to find ways of actually offloading their gift balance or, you know, selling it for Bitcoin or at a loss or, you know, to, to, to actually find those sorts of routes out of, of this sort of closed economy, you know. Um, of 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 the token basically into another into another sort of a space. Yeah, I think yeah, I was super interested in kind of where again compared to institutions and platforms, but where these things were, what these things were backed against that you can have you know forms of crypto that are still well always been backed against the dollar. But if the Amazon gift voucher is backed against Amazon, then what happens to those infrastructures as well? Um, and what happens when they when they fail? Where they kind of how much stability do you have? So it's not, you know, not even the, well, the stability of hard cash versus the perceived stability of the mega institution mm. which is offering it and the terms and conditions. Um, that kind of led me, I think, to the thing that I was thinking about given 
all of what we've been talking about today, and also particularly referencing Alex and Nora's performance yesterday, of the kind of the different aesthetics that are involved here as well. You know, we've talked, I think we opened, we were thinking from the start when we were pulling together this panel about the girl online, which, you know, you, you guys did beautifully yesterday with thinking about cuteness and like I could never, and the kind of, the, the almost the, the cat thing of kind of like, you know, so helpless, so helpless. Um, but then you, you know, you were mentioning obviously the trad wife and her cow, um, but also the the mom influences with their banner ads, which is a very different aesthetic of like capability and like let me show you a different way of doing something with these foodstuffs. Um, and then you have that against like the kind of the um, different forms of currency or tokens that have again that kind of quite tech bland aesthetic of you know a lot of blue a lot of gray a lot of white a lot of shiny maybe a bunch of a bit of neon in there as well and I was curious about like what are these different you guys thought about what these different aesthetics were doing and what they were doing in terms of kind of stability reliability movement something else you know the young the young girl is the, the girl online is is not the girl online is not Barclays. The girl online is not a stable, reliable, you know, yeah. state-backed bank. Maybe yeah. I don't know. Highly um, we can set the we can set up the bank of the young girl online after this. Um, but there's kind of you know these there are so many choices that are made in how these dif different financial systems are represented through aesthetics. And given that we're here, that was what I was curious about. Oh, it's so interesting. I mean. When you said aesthetics, I guess the fr what came into my head wasn't, I wasn't thinking about like financial institutions. I was sort of thinking about how the money was sort of codified because I'm obsessed with like Amazon wish lists. I'm meant to put screen grabs of my Amazon wish list screen grabs into my um, slides and I forgot to because um, I have lots of them. And actually, m my husband is funny. I I've been making like lists of them and he just kind of came across it one day and it was really funny because he was like reading it out and just seeing it read out of context was really funny because he's like black feather whip how to win friends and influence people michael kors clutch uh <laughs> you know animal ears um but so i i was really like fascinated by wish lists and also by what people wished for and the wish list is often it's that like people trying to find that loophole out of the system because you know if only fans for example takes 20% of your of your pay then sometimes the gift can be a way of avoiding it so people will wish for things with high liquidity or they'll wish for things they need um, so they might wish for costumes that they need in their set for example or production equipment um, and but it's really interesting as well sometimes they wish for things that they think people want to buy. And I love like reading discussions on like the OnlyFans forums as well, where people talk about like what is the kind of gift that somebody might want to buy as well. <laughs> you know, so there's an aesthetic, there's a whole kind of art to the gift. And there's also like intermediaries, like there's a company called Wish Tender that will come in and sort of act as a as an in-between and they will take the gift and turn it into money you know, in between and give and give the streamer cash in exchange for the gift. So, you know, all of this kind of stuff going on. But um, just like, yeah, for 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 sometimes for the person uh, who's buying the gift as well, they prefer to to feel like they're giving a gift. It feels sort of parasocial versus for the um, for the person. Um, uh, yeah, they prefer to sort of be giving a gift rather than paying because it feels less sort of transactional. Uh, sorry, you want to jump in? That's sort of my take on aesthetic there. That's just like so exciting because yeah. I feel like this actually addresses maybe like something you mentioned earlier about like what is like, the uh, is the girl online like actually money or not? Yeah. You know, when you're like, that's a foundational question. Yeah. But I think there's something about like the image being money, but money also being an image. Like the, the reason why the girl fares so well online because of her fluency and being um, perceived and always being con reconstructing oneself live in relation to that perception. That's like a really old school, uh, like, I don't know, John Berger-esque way of thinking about like women and the gaze that I think only has intensified um, with this idea of the girl online as a subject that is not quite human. If she is money, for example, she is money that understands image and describing sets of Amazon wish lists. It's like these objects are assembled in a wish list to 
give a sense of a life. I like, I love that part of your book. You're doing like a digital forensics <laughs> into these creators who maybe were otherwise anonymous or you were just accessing their wish list and trying to imagine what kind of person wants to buy a whip and the Charles Saatchi book and uh, Michael Kors clutch. <laughs> so you're kind of trying to stitch together a personality from these things. Whereas, you know, a wish list of a civilian might just be like, I need washcloths for the house and I need to remember to buy those. So it's a very like image-based idea of, like you said, it's not just gift for you or what you need, it's gift for what someone might want to continue to think of you as. Um, and I think the construction of the girl subject always relies on this. It's like, it's like AI, it's like recursive. She's always absorbing new data and then realigning herself or reshaping herself or mutating in relation to that data. And I think that's also why this subject is very confusing to the platform, like designers, architects, whatever the fuck they are, um, tech bros, because they're so, there's a hatred of aesthetics, I think, in that culture. And the mystery behind the, the lubricant of the ultra smooth on the platform is a fluency, an instinctive fluency and acceptance of aesthetics is something that's um, auto-poetic. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I love that. I love the kind of, um, that, the recursiveness kind of feels like it's the thing, a thing that feeds through all of this as well, how it's constantly, you know, as a system that's moving through time, it's constantly reconstituting itself with people who are aging out at 30. Very distressing, but you know, that kind of... Um, <laughs> I was, was yeah. going to ask that, and yeah. then I was like, oh, maybe I don't want to know the answer. Um, like, <laughs> what does that mean for me now? Um, I mean, get an older cow, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and age together. We have about two minutes left, so I was going to see if there were any final kind of points, things, questions, dance routines we want to do to kind of... We didn't get your take on the aesthetics because you have a really good deep history of it, right? Oh, I mean, the stuff I've been interested in is like very, I was going to say very boring, but like it's kind of, it's the payment processes. It's kind of these things that like, you know, they sit in the financial system. If you sell a high risk product, you have to use a payment processor to manage your risk and the way they sell themselves. And I, again, I, I talk about this bit in my book is like you look at them, what their, their visual stuff is and it is kind of the tech bro hatred of aesthetics. Like they're blue, they're gray, they're white. They have a very plain um, sans serif font. You know, they look like anything else that you might think of as a financial logo. But they don't have the stability of things like Visa or MasterCard. Like these are things that kind of they have risen and they have fallen. They have they have fucked around and they have found out, you know. But they have this aesthetic kind of like groundedness of kind of very trustworthy, very trustworthy in a slippery financial system of risk where you just want to buy <coughs> porn or drugs or travel. You know, they are like they are, they are the good guys. And I think that's kind of again in this kind of system of other forms of aesthetics, the boringness of these kind of these risk eaters in the middle of it all, I find fascinating of like what they are presenting as just being so stable, like so reliable. Yeah. Just need a, one of those thin puffer vests. <sighs> That's the aesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> On that horrifying note, um, yeah. shall I? <laughs> Um, thank you both to Alex, thank you to Rachel, thank, thank you to me, you. I guess. Um, yes. Thank you to <laughs> you guys as well for being game and for, yeah, and for meowing and all of this. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.